Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, last Wednesday, the uh, members of Reality Church met at our offices after our uh, uh, once a month believer service to vote on whether the, or not they wanted Daniel Whitworth to, to be their next lead pastor here at Reality Church. And I am pleased to say that the vote was 100% unanimous. So uh, congratulations, Daniel, wherever. I, I saw him over here before. There he is. Daniel, would you stand? Yeah, there's your new pastor right there. He will be leading this church. We're, we'll be having a, a time of prayer with Daniel at the conclusion of today's service. Uh, he doesn't know that yet, but we will. And uh, so it'll be a, a great, joyous uh, time here there's some things that I do want to say before we get to that point, and uh, thus this is going to be uh, the message that I want to get into is, is about where Daniel's going to take this church and uh, what God's going to be doing here as I step down. For those of you who may or may not know, I sensed God speaking to my heart in that gentle whisper as he spoke to Elijah, the prophet Elijah in the uh, Old Testament, the Old Covenant, um, when God spoke to him, he spoke to him in a gentle whisper, a still, small voice. And I sense that still, small voice in me that uh, myself, my wife, and uh, our family, who was still in the house, you know, young enough to move with us, we were to move down to Florida to take care of my mother. And so um, that's what's going to happen. My, my last full Sunday... Uh, here at Reality Church will be May 3rd, and then uh, that will be it for our family. Uh, many of you know about that, probably most of you, if not all. Um, but today will be my final full talk to you as, uh, as the pastor of Reality Church, um, who's headed away and out the door. Um, but my message today isn't so much about that I, I want to give to you some awesome something that is just going to wow you and hope that you'll miss me when I go and say, oh, I wish Steve stayed. It's not, I'm not going to try to do that. It's, that's not my purpose. Um, in fact, my, the most important thing that I'll have to say to you will be on May 3rd. Uh, Daniel said, he, since he's a new pastor, I've got 10 minutes, which he says, which really means for you 20, Steve, but no more than 20. Um, but he scheduled me for 10. Um, so anyway, uh, on that day, on May 3rd, uh, about a month out or so, will be some of the very most important things that I've ever wanted to say to this church that I want to remind you of, that I want to, that, that as I, de I depart, our family departs uh, for Florida, that um, you'll never forget, but that you'll always remember. So today's not that day. Today I want to talk to you about you and your new pastor and what you can expect God to do in him, in you, and through this church. So that's the purpose of my talk today. Some years ago, I'm going to guess about eight, I had the privilege of baptizing Daniel Whitworth and his wife, Nicole, in the ocean here in Virginia Beach. And... Um, I remember distinctly the words that Daniel said after the baptism, and he was being interviewed with Nicole. Um, I, was, I was listening to it, and I remember it was just a touching thing. And in fact, I remember it so well that um, it stuck with me for all these many years about what he said on camera afterward. He said, I got baptized because I wanted everyone to know that I mean it when it comes to following Jesus with my life. I want everyone to know I got baptized because I want people to know that I mean it when I say I'm following Jesus with my life. And then some years later, I had the privilege, the honor, of bringing Daniel on as one of our pastors here at Reality Church and actually ordaining him in front of you, in front of the church here at Reality on a Sunday morning. And now I have the distinct honor and privilege of passing the baton to, to Daniel, where he will lead this great church and pastor it uh, from here on until God says otherwise. 
Um, there's a passage of scripture that I want to show you. This is not the main text for today, but I think it's a great jumping off point into what we're going to be talking about. It's what Jesus said to his disciples. It's found in John chapter 16, and it's very meaningful. And it's very meaningful to you, not only for what Jesus was going to do, but how it's applicable for uh, Daniel's succession uh, of taking my place. Here's the lead pastor at Reality Church, and it's found in John 16, verse 7. And Jesus was, uh, just before he... This was at the Last Supper, the night before he was going to go to the cross, the, the night uh, he was going to be betrayed by Judas. Just prior to that, this is what he said to his followers, his closest people, you. He said, but the truth is that it is best for you that I go away. For if I don't, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, won't come. If I do... He will, for I will send him to you. And as I read that, and as I read that, and as you think about that, I want to say to you that it is to your advantage. It is better for you that I go away, not that I'm comparing myself with Jesus or Daniel, the Holy Spirit, or any of that. But I really mean with all of my heart that as I follow God, and as Daniel follows the Lord and our families, that it is better for you. In fact, I'm convinced, utterly convinced inside of my heart. You know when you say, you know, you know in your knower? You ever say that? I, I know in my knower. I just know that I know that I know. I'm convinced in my knower. I know in my knower that it is to your advantage. It is to the for the best interest of this church that I go and do, that we, our family, go, goes and does what God is calling us to do because there is a need to fulfill in Florida. And it is better that I go because Daniel can come in and take this church to new heights, new vistas, new horizons, new places that I could never take it before. And you might doubt that right now. But I believe that you will see this come to pass as when we talk, as we talk about uh, this, this talk today, this message today, I think you'll see some similarities as to how you can expect and why you can actually expect God to do greater things in and through Daniel Whitworth than he did through me to serve you, to love you, to care for you, and to reach this community and this world. Now, nearly 3,000 years ago, nearly 3,000 years ago, the prophet Elijah erupted on the scene in 9th century B.C. Samaria, without warning and without fanfare. Abruptly, he's shown on the scene in 1 Kings chapter 17, and he appears to Ahab, not just out of the blue, but he approaches Ahab, the king, and he says this, As the Lord lives, the God of Israel whom I serve, there will be no dew or rain except at my bidding. And then he just walks away, doesn't wait for a response, doesn't wait for Ahab to say anything. He just leaves. In and out. Nobody hurt. Boom. But he says, there's going to be no rain, no dew for three and a half years, except at what I say. I mean, this guy is a bold dude, this Elijah guy. Uh, we know he's a Tishbite. He's from Gilead. But that's about all we know of his past. But God called him, and God called him to prophetically foresee and foretell what was going to take place in the land of Israel at that time to the kings of Israel. Elijah, whose name means my God is the Lord, it's an appropriate name because he was the stalwart opponent for Baal worship, Baal, B-A-A-L. This was the common God of that day for those who were not uh, Israelites, and uh, he was the great opponent of that false god. And he was sent, Elijah was sent to turn the nation of Israel and its leaders back to the Lord because they were turned away from the Lord, back to the Lord through his prophetic messages and his miracles. Elijah is a powerful guy. He's extraordinary in so many ways. He's, he's an impressive figure. In fact, he dresses in distinctive clothing and is instantly recognizable when people see him, according to 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8. And after serving the Lord for about 20 years, Elijah, serving God for about 20 years in a prophetic sort of ministry, 
God tells him that someone else was to replace him in that role. So let's go ahead and read who that was and what that was all about. So here Elijah serving God for 20 years in a powerful sort of way. God now speaks to him and tells him there's going to be a replacement for you. And that's where we pick up in 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's pick it up in verse 15. Here's what it says. Then the Lord told Elijah, anoint Elisha to replace you as my prophet. Now again, my friends, I don't want you to think that I'm considering myself as a prophet. I don't. Nor Daniel a prophet. We don't. But there's parallels in this, as you'll see, in, in the sense that, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm a little older, better looking for sure than Daniel, but older, and, uh, and that he is to take my place. So I don't want you to get the idea that Steve thinks he's like, awesome dude, like an Elite. I don't. I don't think that. He had hair. I didn't have, I don't have hair. He had a lot of it. Elisha was bald. So that's the backwards part right there for us. So it's, it's not all similarities, but there's plenty of them. And what I'm bringing this to your attention for today is because I want you, with all of my heart, to be assured that the decision that God has made for this church, for you, for the leadership of this church, is the right decision, that you will not be disappointed. Oh, you'll have little disappointments maybe here and there, but for, in the long run, as you see and you look forward and then you, you know, you'll look back in hindsight in the rearview mirror and you go, oh, that's why. You'll see God doing great and mighty things and you will be glad that this transition took place. Let's go ahead and read. So he says, anoint Elisha to replace you, Elijah, as my prophet. So we pick it up in verse 19. So Elijah went and found Elisha, the, the son of Saphat, plowing a field. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Then Elisha left to follow Elijah as his assistant. Now, it is a common thing that if a prophet in that day came up to you and tossed whatever of theirs on you, you were their successor and you were to follow them if indeed you, you wanted to. Um, what's interesting as well that... Uh, God always calls people who are doing something. Uh, Moses was tending sheep, God called him. David was tending sheep, God called him. Elisha, plowing a field, God calls him. Amos, farming, God calls him. Uh, Matthew in the New Testament, collecting taxes as an evil guy, God calls him. God always calls people who are doing something. If you're waiting for God to call you, get busy. That's yeah, just a side free note. It didn't cost anything. It was just there. Now, during their approximately six years together, Elijah is very formative. He has a very formative influence on Elisha as his disciple, Elisha's, Elijah's disciple. Elisha, the one who's following Elijah, just think of the Shah as later in the alphabet. He's the younger one. Um, <clears throat> he's following him. And and in many ways, both literally and figuratively, Elisha begins to take on some of the characteristics of Elijah. Not all of them by any means, but many of them. And he's learning and he's seeing. And I want you to know that over these years that Daniel has been at my side, he's served with me about eight years. He's been at my side for four years, serving as my right-hand man, teaching me plenty of things. Uh, showing me, giving me wisdom, instructing me, praying for me, uh, caring about me, helping me in just so many ways. I couldn't be more grateful. I couldn't have a better assistant than Daniel all these years. And I want you to know, I think that Elijah felt that way as well. And so they were here six years together. And, um, and then having said that, that, they were, that, that Elijah kind of poured into Elisha, and Elisha learned and gained uh, insights as well. Um, one of the cool things about Elisha, the one who was following Elijah, was that he kind of came into his own. And if you've been around here, you've known in the last couple of years that Daniel has really kind of come into his own. 
Why is that? Because God has matured him and raised him up. And God has matured and raised up Elisha. And, and, and Elisha and Daniel allows God and allowed God to use him in unique ways that he wasn't using Elijah and that God's not using me. It's very interesting to see. And so let's take a look at some of these unique ways that, uh, that God would, would use Elijah and Elisha. And here's what it says. Let's, let's jump now to 2 Kings chapter 2. This is when the transfer took place where um, uh, Elisha became actually became the successor of Elijah and what happened. Here's what it says. 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 1. Just before the Lord took Elijah up to heaven in a windstorm, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elisha told, excuse me, Elijah told Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as certainly as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. It's interesting. Maybe that was a test. You stay here and I'm going to go. No, no, I'm going to be your disciple. I'm going to follow you. And he went with him. And then it says um, in verse 3, some members of the prophetic guild, this is like a prophetic community of prophets, prophetic guild in Bethel came out to Elisha and said, do you know that today the Lord is going to take your master from you? And he answered, that is Elisha answered, yes, I know, be quiet. In other words, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to be sad about it. Shut up. Okay. And then verse 4, Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he replied, as certainly as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they, plural, went to Jericho. Again, maybe a test. Are you going to stay with me? Are you going to leave my side? Are you, what are you going to do? He said, I'm not leaving. I'm going to follow you. Even if you tell me, stay, no, no, no. I got to follow you. I've got to be, I've got to learn from you. And he did. And some members of the prophetic guild in Jericho approached Elisha and said, do you know that today the Lord is going to take your master from you? And he said, yes, I know. Shut your mouth. Be quiet. And Elisha said to him, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he replied a third time, as certainly as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they traveled on together. The 50 members of the prophetic guild went and stood opposite them from a distance, while Elijah and Elisha stood by the Jordan, the Jordan River. And Elisha, excuse me, Elijah took his cloak, his mantle, his coat, if you will, and he folded it up and he hit the water with it. He hit the river Jordan, smacked it, boom, with his coat. And the water, water divided and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. A miracle took place right there. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, what can I do for you before I am taken away from you? Let's just stop there for a moment. What can I do for you before I am taken away from you? Now, when that was asked, so here you've got this, this awesome prophet Elijah, a very powerful guy, uh, very bold and courageous. And, 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 he, and he said, you know, he's been around the block, right? He's got his protege with him. What can I do for you before I go? I suspect that Elisha was smart enough and wise enough and godly enough to consider that question and not answer it so quickly. But I think his answer was the best answer that probably could have been uttered. But I bet he took some time to think about it. What would you answer? If God asked you, if somebody asked you, you know, what, what do you want me to do for you before I leave? I mean, what great thing? What can I do for you? Elisha's answer was a godly answer because he wanted to serve the people, the nation, this church. He wanted, he wanted to serve people in a greater way than even Elijah did. And here's what he said. Elisha answered, may I receive a double portion of the prophetic spirit that energizes you? May I receive a double portion of the prophetic spirit that energizes you? You've done great things in this land, Elijah. 
I've seen, I've heard. The tales have been told. You're well known. Uh, people love you. Uh, the, the, the enemies of God don't like you at all. But you're mighty and powerful and you're used of God. And you're bringing good things to this land and the people of God. I want what you've got, but I want a double portion of it. I mean, that's not a selfish request because it wasn't about him. It was about the people. It was about the nation. It was about the community of believers and followers of the true and living God. Give me a double portion of the prophetic spirit that energizes you. And Elijah replied, that's a difficult request. And then in a prophetic statement, he says, if you see me taken away from you, if you watch me go when God takes me, however he's going to take me, if you see me go, may it be so. But if you don't see me go, it won't happen. Prophetic word comes out. <clears throat> and as they were walking along and talking, Suddenly, a fiery chariot pulled by fiery horses appeared. You say, Steve, how is that possible? If, if you have to ask me how is that possible, I'm just, I mean, when we talk about God, if you have a problem with miracles, you really don't have a problem with miracles. You have a problem with the God of the miracles. Because it's not about miracles. It's about do you believe in a God who can do miracles? If the God, the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, created the heavens and the earth, it's no issue for him to do something like this or anything else. So if you have an issue with miracles, just realize your issue is not with miracles. Your issue is with the God of miracles. Can he pull it off? I kind of just believe he can. I know he's changed my life in a dramatic, dramatic way. And he's changed millions of people's lives in crazy, dramatic ways. But he's also done miraculous things beyond life change. And, you know, the resurrection's another one. How does a dead man come back to life? You know, that's not what this talk is about. But, I mean, if he, God can pull that off, he can pull this off. So, he, so these fiery chariots, these fiery, chariot, these fiery horses pull up in, in one sense and, and uh, being pulled by fiery horses that appeared. And they went between Elijah and Elisha, it says. And Elijah went up to heaven in a windstorm. While Elisha was watching, he was crying out, My father, my father, the chariot and horsemen of Israel, which meant that Elijah was a father figure to Elisha, and that he was, the, it says, the chariot and horsemen of Israel, meaning he protected Israel and Israel's armies, Israel's people from enemies coming against them, like those who would pull horses and chariots and go to battle. There's this protector, and that's what pastors do. Pastors protect the people of God in that church. It's always been my desire, my heart, to protect you from, from false, false things out there, things that are not biblical, things that are anti-biblical, unbiblical, things that are poor doctrine, poor teaching, poor you know, uh, ways to live, and all of this. And it's been a heart passion of mine to protect you from that. And, um, and so Elijah, Elijah says, you know, Father, Father, you know, you, you've been like a, a father to me. You've been a protector of Israel. He said that. And he, he was crying that out. And then he could see him no longer. And he grabbed his clothes and he tore them in two. Just, ah, he's not here anymore. Now, really, it is on me. Now, really, the one that I loved, the one that I, I followed, the one that I served, the one that I learned from, the one that was my mentor is gone. And there's, there's pain there. And there's going to be pain, maybe initially when I leave for some of you, and, and maybe a little bit for Daniel, probably not too much for him. But there's going to be some of that, because some of you are going to compare me with Daniel and Daniel with me and all this. But I, got to, I want to tell you something. In not a too distant future, you're going to be glad. I'm glad Steve went. It'll be good. I wish he got the chariot and the horse like Elijah did, but, uh, you know, I guess his car will have to do, you know. So you'll be glad. You'll look back, but right now there's, there may be a little pain. You know, I just can't see this being what I've, I've wanted it to be, but it's going to be better for you. You're, you're going to just have to trust God in this. Yeah, I don't want you to trust me, uh, even though I kind of want you to. I, I mean, ultimately, you can't trust a human, ultimately, 
you ultimately have to put your full trust in God. Now, I'll let you down sometimes, maybe not intentionally, maybe sometimes intentionally, but probably not. Um, but God, he's, he's solid. He doesn't ever let us down, does he? Does he? He doesn't let us down. And so <clears throat> he tore his clothes in two in verse 13. And he picked up Elijah's coat, cloak that had fallen off of him. And he went back and he stood on the shore of the Jordan. Here, can you just imagine? He's got this Elijah's coat in his hand. And he's probably looking at it. He says, you know, if you see me go, you can have a double portion of the prophetic spirit that energized me, it'll be on you. And he's got this coat in his hand. He's like, I got to get back across the Jordan this way. What am I going to do? And with that coat, he says, he hit the water. And he said, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he hit the water, it divided. And Elijah crossed over. The miracle began to happen immediately. The good stuff began to take place pronto. And so began Elisha's 55-year career as a prophet of God. And although Elijah was better known of these two figures in many ways, Elisha is even a more active prophet than his predecessor. Let me go through some thoughts with you here. Did you know that Elijah performed eight miracles, but Elisha performed 16? God used him to perform double the amount of miracles than Elijah did. They had different approaches of working with people. Uh, Elijah lets fire consume those who sought to apprehend him. <laughs> Elisha is more lenient and merciful on people. Uh, that is so crazy true. Like, Steve... Don't bring fire down on people. Yeah. It's kind of like my personality is sort of like that. Um, Elijah is often alone. Elisha is usually with other people. Um, I, I like working quite a bit alone. Daniel is, has this, I'm telling you, it's a newfound sort of passion in him to do ministry in teams far, far, far better than I've ever done. I think it says in the Bible, Elijah was always late. Elisha's always on time. It's probably in there somewhere. <laughs> Only some of you will get that one. <laughs> Elisha is a sort of self-reliant kind of guy. And Elisha seems to live life engaged with other people. And, and it's interesting. I, I, and it's a personality thing, isn't it? Um, you know, I have a different personality than Daniel, and Daniel has a different personality than me. One of the great things I think about Daniel and Nicole and what they do is, is they're, they're always having people over their homes, and, you know, it's, they're, they're engaged with people, I think, quite a bit more than I am. And I think that'll be great for this body. And I think a, a great pastor does those kinds of things. There are definitely places where I have fallen short and not been... Uh, the kind of pastor that I probably should have been for people. Um, I, I don't think Daniel will be a perfect pastor. I don't think there's such thing. But I think he'll be better for this church. He's going to take it to where, from where it is, and just it's going to go up and to the right. And I look forward to that. And I think you should get on the bandwagon. I think you should be part of what God's going to be doing. And you're going to see from this point on, you're going to see good things happen. Things are going to change. Some things he's going to do differently. And I applaud that. I'm for that. I want to see him come into his own and do what God's called him to do because I'm going and I want this church to continue to grow and to succeed uh, in great ways and to make, be a difference changer in this community and around the globe. I believe that Daniel, with you, together, can make that difference and see this happen. Um, we see that Elijah performs his prophetic acts without the aid of others. But Elisha often delegates someone to bring the prophetic message. <laughs> Elijah, Elisha implements what God told Elijah to do but didn't. Now here's one thing I want to share with you. There, ha there has truly been a part of me that's been fearful of doing something that I felt God told me to do but I have never done. And that's do a, a building campaign to build a church. I've just... Never wanted to do it. Been scared to do it. 
Never done it. I hate asking people for money. Because in my head, I think, yeah, that's what they all think. They all just want the money. you know. So I've never done it. And I probably disobeyed God. In fact, I'd have to say I did. I have. But to Daniel's credit, I believe that God's going to do great things. And he's probably going to lead this church to a place where you guys are going to have your own building sometime, your own land and building. And, and, I, and I read that, and I'm like, oh, man, that, that's, that hurts. It's not that God's trying to beat me up. I, I think God has brought Daniel to take this church to places where I was not willing to take it or could not take it. And I, and I like that. Um, and so here, again, I want to say that Elisha implements what God told Elijah to do but didn't. God told Elijah to anoint two different kings, and he never did it. To anoint them as king, and he never did it. And years later, Elisha does it. Elisha advises three kings on matters, all matters of the day. Three different kings. Elijah doesn't have a good relationship with any king. Elijah was dramatic and charismatic and bold and in your face. And Elisha was more chilled out, more of a pastor, a better leader. Elijah is more well-known because of his personality, but Elisha's career as a prophet had greater long-term effect on the history of Israel than did Elijah. In general, one may say that Elijah was a warrior and a preacher, while Elisha was more of a statesman and a man of action. They all had their distinctive roles, and they brought a special message with the uh, distinctive role. Um, but immediately upon Elijah's departure, the Lord began to prove to the kings and to the people and to the nations of the world that Elisha was his appointed prophet to replace Elijah. And I believe that immediately upon my departure, God will do a similar thing here because his calling on Daniel and his anointing of Daniel through his spirit is mighty and powerful. Daniel's role will, will, will need to be not how much has he accomplished compared to me or others. That, that won't be what he's looking at. That won't be what he's supposed to be about. It's not going to be like, you know, Steve did this much, but I did this much. It's, that's not what he's into, and that's not what it should be. Daniel's role should be how well am I fulfilling the potential God gave me to serve him. It's not how much am I like Steve or not like Steve, but how much am I like Christ. That will be Daniel's call. It will be Daniel's role not to say how many people serve me, but how many people am I serving. It will be Daniel's role not, uh, to say or to think not how many people love and accept me, but how many people do I accept and do I love. Now, as we close today, I want to ask you, because I've got two more passages of Scripture I want to read um, that has to do with uh, the Apostle Paul's encouragement and admonition to his young protege, Timothy, who is going to be pastor um, and lead a great church. And so I want to ask uh, Daniel, as the new pastor here at Reality Church, if you'd, you'd come up here. I know he's not ready for this, but that's, that's okay. And, um, and just join me right up here please. My friends, this part of the talk today, the message, is really, really important because um, if, it's, if, it's, if this is going to work, then Daniel is going to have to be the man that God's called him to be, and I believe he will be. I have full confidence in Daniel. I, wouldn't, and I told the people at the Wednesday night believer service that if there's any man in America that I would want to turn this church over to, it would be, it'd be Daniel. Uh, but Daniel, there is a, um, there's a passage of Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that I want to read to you as both an encouragement and an urging to you. An urging to you. It's an encouragement. And, and this first part is the encouragement uh, and, and that you all need to hear, especially. And so here, I want to read this to you. It's not, do I have this on the screen, you guys? I do. Okay. So here it is. Daniel, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Let no one look down on you because you are young. But instead, set an example for the believers in your speech, 
in your conduct, your love, your faithfulness, and your purity. And then Paul goes on to say to Timothy, and I want to say to Daniel, until I come, come back. He has to invite me back every so often. <clears throat> Daniel, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you have given to you and confirmed by prophetic words when the elders laid hands on you. And I remember the day that Daniel was down on his knees at Kellum High School and being ordained as the pastors laid hands on him. Daniel, be diligent in these matters. The matters of what? Of public reading of scripture, of exhortation and teaching and not neglecting the spiritual gifts you have. Be diligent in these matters and give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Keep a close watch in how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. And so then, finally, what I want to say to Daniel in the presence of everyone here is this uh, note, this statement that Paul made to Timothy in his second letter to Timothy when he was finished and complete writing him as the pastor of this, uh, the church that, past, that Timothy was pastoring. And here's what he said. And again, Daniel, I want to say this to you. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct Patiently rebuke and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time will come when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. People will want to follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you, Daniel, must be self-controlled at all times. You must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You must do the work of an evangelist and fully carry out the ministry that God has given to you. And so with that, what I'd like to do is, in front of you all, I have a baton here that I want to pass to Daniel. And it reads this way, Elisha answered, may I receive a double portion of the prophetic spirit that energizes you. And Daniel, in front of this body, with all my heart, I want to pass this to you. Would you stand to your feet? And Daniel's going to close in just a moment, but I want to pray over Daniel with you. And I'm going to ask my sweet wife, Julie, I don't know where she is, but to come up here. The reason I'm asking uh, Julie to come up <clears throat> is because, is because uh, when we started this church and launched it 12 years ago next week, uh, we started with two people in our living room. And uh, there's been lots of hard trials, and you just never know, is, was the church going to make it? Is it viable? Uh, we knew we needed to start a church that was going to reach the culture, that was going to make sense to people when they heard the talk. When they uh, came to church, it wasn't going to be a, a boring, dry experience. It was going to be something that was life-changing and transforming. And uh, I know that Daniel will continue this and even do a better job than we have done, and I'm grateful for that. So would you do me a favor? In a sign of your prayer for him, would you extend your hand forward? and just this, It's just symbolic. If you're willing to, would you just extend your hand forward as we pray over him as he leads uh, this church? Father... We thank you for Daniel, and we know that in his heart, you have, you have placed your spirit in a mighty way. It's not about him we know. It's about your gifting and your hand on him. And Lord, as we pass the baton to him, so to speak, I do pray that a double portion of your prophetic spirit, of your spirit, would be his, would be upon him. 
and that any giftings that I have had, uh, that somehow, in some way, according to your divine plan, you will transfer and give to him anything and everything to cause this church to be all you want it to be. To make this place not just great here, but so influential in this community and around the globe that people will be amazed that people will see all the good things that you are and have and will yet do in our midst. I want to thank you for Reality Church and the honor of, uh, of just allowing me to lead this church for the last dozen years or so. And uh, Father, I could not give it to a better man. I couldn't turn it over. It's not me who's really doing this, I know, but you are. And I thank you for that. And I thank you that you brought him our way. And I know he's a gift to this church, and I pray this church will treat him as a gift, not put him on a pedestal, but to treat him as the gift that he is to this body and that they will follow his leadership and he will lead well. God, we give him into your hands, and we thank you for that. In your mighty name and all God's people said, amen.